understand something, and so the competencies are, and so we'll be able to do these things. And they are all in line with our, our mission statement about what we believe about IB learners. And um, every year we update it to make sure that we are not just living with a document that never ever changes. So you can see this year, these are the additions that we highlighted in yellow, and that has to do with our new definition of learning and our new definition of um, global citizenship. So this is that foundation against which, it's kind of like a report card. You think about the criteria, you have students who have, who do an assessment and then they get some feedback on criteria. This is very much along those same lines. Does any of you have any questions about that before I go to the next one? And then we have this um, teacher growth and appraisal system, which is multifaceted. So you can have, a, there's the idea of a snapshot or an album. And if you have a single snapshot, that's maybe just one moment in time, but if you have different, different moments in time and different perspectives and different, different sources of information, then that gives you a broader understanding about how, how things are happening within the classroom. So we divide, we, thank you, we divide, we identify uh, two main categories, uh, first of all, which is track A and track B. Track A is really for our newest teachers, so the first two years that they're at HIS, as well as anybody who is, has a new role at HIS. They're on track A, and it's a little bit more, um, say intense, but it's a little bit more of a, a thorough process in terms of conversations and um, observations, more formalized observations. So that's our track, track um, A. And then we have having the coaching conversations as well. Track B and more track B, but also same with track A, is where you have these, uh, these, um, these snapshots where you go into a class and you're just getting the pulse of how the, the lesson is going. And then it's been really difficult with COVID. When we first launched it, and now that we're finally on campus again, you go in and you have some learning questions. So you might grab a student, and then you pull up the student, and you say, I'd like to ask you some questions. And you do a quick recording, and then you send that to the teacher. And the teacher gets to see the inside of that student's mind for a moment to see, oh, that's what this student is thinking about. Teachers also do surveys of students to gather some information. And then, of course, we have this, um, this data about what what kind of data are we analyzing? So we spent some time recently looking at math data and seeing how that information can guide um, our understanding of, of students and how we can best support them. So all of that data is also um, very important, not only math data. In addition to that, it's just as a quick um, aside, is we are starting um, to develop a more coherent system where we'll be able to to say, well, what data do we really want to be looking at beyond that? And how do we gather and how do we measure it? Which is, which is really important. Uh, so we're going to be defining how, does, how do we know that we offer um, high quality learning at HIS. So that's something that's still a work in progress, but we're still doing it, but we'll be doing it even more thoroughly as we move forward. You'll also see, and then there's an end of your reflection where we kind of bring all this together and then we file it and make sure that we're making sure that we have the, the right people at HIS. We also have this track C, and track C is for teachers who, if you go back to, if you're thinking about those professional standards, who may not at the moment be meeting those professional standards. So that person chooses a member from the senior leadership team to be their coach, and it's a very rigorous and very, I would say it's a very intense and supportive, rigorous, intense and supportive process. Um, and there are three different outcomes from that process. One of the option, one of the outcomes could be success, that, that um, teacher is, becomes able to meet all of those uh, the standards. Another option may be that the teacher says, maybe this isn't the right school for me, and they say, okay, I won't come back next year. And uh, the third option may be the school decides that the teacher is no longer a good fit. Those, um, all three of them are, are possible. We like the first one because that means that we can continue to work together and it's a success, but it doesn't mean that the other two don't on occasion happen. And that's why we have that track C. Any questions about that? Am I over? I'm talking too much. 
Okay. Oh, and if we, it's, I think it's probably relevant to note that this um, approach to our graphic professional growth and appraisal, and you notice that growth is first and appraisal is second, um, that when they spoke to our community, when they were here for their visit, we got a commendation on this, which is actually quite rare. So I think that's, that's, a, that's a nice um, kudos. And this was from teachers. It wasn't just listening to me. It was talking to teachers as well about this process. Okay. And then we had a few questions that were received in advance, and I will go through them relatively quickly, and then if we have any other questions, then we can, um, we can open it up to more questions. So the first question was about in-service days. And could we, for in-service days, could we have in-service days maybe on the weekend instead of having days off of school and having kids at home? And we have, so the answer to that is that, so there's a clarification, is that on Wednesdays we have faculty meetings. And those faculty meetings are generally based on what is important and more timely. So what's happening in the year, these things need to happen so those, those meetings to get, uh, need to take place. And then um, other days of the week, the teachers are involved in co uh, leading co-curricular activities or other responsibilities, so they aren't able to meet at that time. Uh, Saturdays, we don't really have our teachers come in on Saturdays. They need some time to breathe and relax, and of course they're doing some planning and marking as well, um, so we don't generally have in-service on the, on the weekends. And in-service itself is a, longer uninterrupted period of time when our teachers can work collaboratively to, together on ideas that are more strategic in nature and need a little bit more time um, and they have they can be more kind of forward thinking or reflective so that's why we have that time um, very common in international schools and i think we have i see we have some faculty members here and i think that they would agree that those days are better than a saturday and with that we're still hitting the number of days Yes, thank you, thank you. Yes, so the, and the board's responsibility is to make sure that we have our minimum number of student contact days, a, a minimum of 175, and we exceed that number of days. So that is, yeah, we de never compromise on the number of, of student days. Ah, at a distance learning, we are constantly refining and developing our, based on the feedback that we get from students, from colleagues, and from parents about how we can improve that. Even when we reopened, a week after that, we got together with our senior leadership team and put together a bunch of ideas and planned out how, heaven forbid, we would have to be in off-campus learning, not at a distance learning, what things we would continue to improve upon. So that's part of our embedded processes that we do as a senior leadership team. If you ever have any ideas or thoughts or reflections or something that you'd like to share with us, please do that. You can write to the principals directly and um, because that, those, ended, those personal stories are really important. Um, Richard, you can have a break from, from me speaking for a moment, and uh, I'll have, have you with Richard. Thank you. My favorite topic. <laughs> <laughs> After all the exciting projects and everything we've heard about tonight, um, I'll talk about the dress code. So um, just, just to um, make you all aware, I didn't wake up one morning with a headache <laughs> and decide to fight with students about dress code. But I think it, it really stemmed from campus closure and being, we've always had a dress code, and, but through campus closure and then coming back onto campus and um, how students were dressed not being our number one priority, it was masks and health screening and cleaning desks and the students also spent a lot of time outside which might have added to the relaxed feeling, you know, we're, we're on the beach, relaxing um, and then um, you know from uh, Zimbabwean parents um, international parents parents walking around asking questions don't don't you have a dress code and then then what happens is comments are made and then somebody goes to a student and oh, normally me because somebody's commented to me um, that that student's not meeting the dress code so I would then go and speak to a student and it turned out that our dress code that we had which hadn't been enforced for a while was not really enforceable. Uh, students, many students had joined during um, distance learning and, and didn't know, and then it, it was spreading as well. So then everyone was getting more and more relaxed and it was, it was getting probably further away from how people 
fit for purpose in terms of school and also being respectful to, um, to our, our Zimbabwean culture. So obviously if you go to the mall in Zimbabwe, you will see different things from if you go probably to a, a Zimbabwean university. Because at a, at, a, at a university, there would be a certain level of, of dress. Um, so we had a process where some students on the wellbeing group started grappling with this and doing some research. Part of that research was um, surveying the students. And what we realized then was that the views were so diverse, from let's have a uniform to let's not have a dress code at all. And we realized that our current dress go code was, could not get any more relaxed. So what started out perhaps as a review that could have turned into something better was really, okay, for the students, other than those who think we shouldn't have a dress code, what can they say about our current dress code? Which was really, it's not clear, it's, um, it's, um, it's, it, it's not gender neutral, it, it targets girls more than boys is what they were saying, and, um, and, they, and they don't know, they don't understand, and they don't want the embarrassment of being dress, uh, dress coded, as they call it. And how can we clear this and have it really clear for everybody and, and a set thing that happens? So for example, if you're not dressed appropriately, what happens? It's not a big deal, there's no detentions. It's simply, you know, how can it be rectified? We can lend you a shirt, you can call your parents, or you can put something else on. And, and I think on the whole, uh, um, although it, it obviously has upset a few students, I think on the whole it's becoming much easier to manage and people are getting used to it. The new dress code is not more stringent than the old one. It's simply in much more detail because that's really what we needed for it to be clear and that's what the students wanted. And we've used a template from, that the students found from um, Oregon where they had a massive school um, problem with, with school dress code, and that has been, um, they had to come up with this gender neutral um, dress code that suited a very diverse community, perhaps a little like ours, where we've got Muslim students, and we've got um, Zimbabwean students, and we've got international students, European and US, all within those groups have very different ideas of their dress code. So I think we're on the right track, but it wasn't a sudden clamp down. It was simply starting to enforce something that we should have enforced all along, but having a clear way to enforce it. Are, are there any questions on the dress code? Yeah, quick wait time. <laughs> okay, this one is very, very quick. We um, had advertised in our bulletin for a number of different groups of people to join different teams. That included the OTPT team, it included um, some other things, the Tarasai, I am the coffee tender as well, and then a group for a communications committee. Um, we had one person join the communications committee, and then we had the second person say that they would be interested, and so it's um, a little bit on hold until we get a little bit more. If there is somebody here who would love to join, this working team, please reach out to me. You can send me an email and then um, we can get that up to them. So that's, if that's the end of our formal, um, I guess, agenda part of our meeting. And I think we, I haven't even looked at my, I don't have a watch at the moment. Should we open up to questions now? Yeah. I have a question. Okay.
Thank you. Uh, Richard, any, so what, you mentioned uniform as one extreme. Um, any broad thoughts on the possibility of that extreme and, you know, whether that would work or not? You're trying to get me executed. <laughs> I, I, I think the student that made that comment was talking about a, a fairly relaxed uniform, and, and from the perspective that that um, they it, it equals things between the students. So it takes away some of the dress code stuff. But in, in previous uniform schools that I've, I've worked in, it's, it's the same thing. There, there's still ways to to change it. So I think it, it, it came more from an equality perspective that, that all students can afford the same clothes. I, 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 I don't have any personal uh, personal views on that. I, I, I think both can, can work. But, but that was one. Uh, a few students had that. that view. I have a question on the dress code. I'm sorry. <laughs> You say that it's a gender neutral, right? You try to make it gender neutral. Gender neutral, right? Yes. Yes, but my question is, in the one, one the people who are getting dress code, are there more girls or more girls to get dress code? Because that means that maybe it's not gender neutral. And I think that's very important because when you have like a, a teenage, especially teenage girls and boys, they are very sensitive when it comes to being treated in a fair way and those kind of things. And I think we should be very careful. If the girls are being more less coded than the boys, I think it means that there's a problem somewhere. So um, I was asked exactly the same question by one of the grade 11s that I, that I was speaking to. Um, it, it, it is it is more girls that, that are being spoken to because the it stems from the, the, the it's, it stems from the view of the difference between a woman's upper body and a man's upper body. Now I'm not saying that's right, I don't have a view on that. But that, that is what leads to um, the area of the body that, that we've chosen from the Oregon study that is an area that needs to be covered by all genders. And the style of girls' clothes often means that they um, that those clothes don't meet that that requirement. There are many girls' clothes that do. So it is really a tough one. But um, you know, it's not about it's not about our views on on the differences. What we've been very careful with is the wording of the policy that is talking about this area of the body uh, is is covered for all students, regardless of their their gender. And um, yeah, I, I, I don't I, I don't see any way around that except keeping it very neutral. Whereas before, the dress code used to say, say things like no underwear must be shown, and that definitely targets the female gender more. Whereas now it doesn't say that; it's just an area of the body which needs to be covered for males and females. I don't know if that helps, but it is a difficult one. Thank you so much, Richard, um, and thank you to all the parents who are here. Um, we tried to, you know, to have an hour for this meeting. Um, it has gone past an hour, uh, but we appreciate um, the feedback and the, the discussions which uh, went on. So I would like to close off the meeting and um, hoping that there are no more questions. If there are questions, one, two, three, we can go. Any more questions? <laughs> okay, yeah, thank you so much and thank you Adam and Tim and uh, everyone else behind the setting up of this meeting and to all the parents and those who are at home. Good night everyone. Bye.